Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us again today. Uh, my name is Simran and I'm with Canopy. Canopy is a co working space based in San Francisco. And today I have one of my favorite talks that we do um, with the National Geographic Explorers. Um, and Ravinda Sigal is joining us today. He's a professor of biology at San Francisco State and a National Geographic Explorer. And he's going to be talking about deforestation and emotion diseases. So, uh, before you start, let me, um, we're going to, so we're just going to talk, then I'm going to open up to Q&A so people can either type in the chat box their questions or digitally raise their hand. Um, and I'll, I'll help field the questions for him. Um, all right, Raymond, there is all you. Great. So I'll share my screen again, right? Yep. Go ahead and share your screen. Okay. There we go. So do you see that now? Yes, that's perfect. We can see it. Perfect. All right, so my name is Ravindra Segal. I'm a professor at San Francisco State University in the Department of Biology, and I am also a National Geographic Explorer, among other things. And so I am very excited to talk to you about, about some of the research we do and how it's pertinent to what we're going through today and these days with the coronavirus. Um, our work has to do with deforestation and how that affects emerging diseases. The work I do is mostly studying malaria in birds. And so most of you probably don't know that birds get malaria, which is a disease that affects millions of people, but also affects birds. And so the research that I've been doing for many years now basically explores what happens when you cut down a rainforest, how does it affect diseases? And so I will just begin by saying a few things I have a lot of uh, collaborators. And so anytime a scientist does work, it has a lot of different people that do that work together with the scientists. And so this is a collaborative group of scientists with people from San Francisco State University, also from Cameroon, where I do most of the work, as well as Lithuania and UCLA. And of course, I have San Francisco State students as well involved in this project. The funding was from several sources. Um, we had funding from the NSF for this and also USAID, plus, of course, National Geographic. What does it mean to be a National Geographic Explorer? It means that we have funding from National Geographic and support for different projects. Um, I am a coordinator of the National Geographic Explorers of Northern California. And so we coordinate our group of explorers and we have various meetings and we have various uh, group activities that we do. And I'm very grateful to Simran and Canopy Space for hosting this. We've also done another um, explorer group before this. So I'll get into it now. What do I study? So I'm not going to go into a very deep scientific talk. I'm going to give more of a basic overview of the types of things that I and my collaborators do. So we work on deforestation, and one of the contributors to deforestation, of course, is palm oil industry. So the palm oil industry is basically leading to rapid deforestation, destruction of the world's uh, tropical rainforest. And with that, I also study bird diseases. The main one I study is malaria, but I also study avian pox, trypanosoma, which causes sleeping sickness and Chagas disease in humans, and other avian diseases. So what's nice about birds is that they have the same types of diseases as humans, but they are very good for ecological studies. So as you know, our habitats and climate are changing rapidly. So here are forests in the world right now. You see these green patches here. These are the forests that we see today. And uh, we're losing a lot of them, of course because of deforestation and also because of climate change. So these are the areas that I work in. I've done some work in Alaska also with National Geographic funding. I work in California. I've done work in Costa Rica, also in Brazil, and of course in Africa. So the work that I'm gonna be talking about today is the work we do in Cameroon. But I've also done work in several other African countries, including uh, Gabon and um, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana and Uganda. So we do this work basically studying what happens to birds and their populations and the mosquitoes that infect birds with malaria. So first of all, I wanted to show you what's happening with um, 
uh, with depop with overpopulation. Whoops. I wanted to keep the. I wanted to show you a video now. So can you see this video if I have this on? Uh, you need to do a screen share again. Okay, screen share. All right. All right. All right. So here you see what's happening with the world's population. Um, it's ridiculous how fast the world is growing. Right now we have about 7.8 billion people on the planet. These are the number one countries. You can see how with population growth in the last um, hundred years, you've seen this tremendous, tremendous population growth. And so I'm looking at this one over here. We expect to have 9 billion by 2037, 8 billion by 2023. Right now we're at 7.8 billion. And when I was born in 1966, we had 3.5 billion. And now we're basically double that just in my lifetime. And it took until basically 1960 to reach 3 billion. And we've added that many just in my lifetime. So the, the remarkable thing is how does this affect the world's population? How does the population affect our planet? And that is one of the reasons we have such overpopulation and rampant diseases from um, animals now is because of these um, rampant population growth. So now I'm going to go back to new share. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint here, share, and go back here. So deforestation. Um, uh, we're losing about 5% of the African rainforest every year. So that means in about 20 years, we won't have any rainforest left. That's the frightening thing about our planet right now. We're losing um, our forests at about 5% a year. 23% of the tropical rainforest in Africa remain. In this picture on the right, you can see the windy impenetrable forest in Uganda. And absolutely, it's not very impenetrable anymore. You can see there's agriculture all around it. So palm oil, this is where I work in Cameroon. And you can see this is a palm oil plantation where they've cut down the forest and you can see the remaining trees in the back there, but the little young palm trees are in the front and they're um, populating the area with young palm trees. The rapid growth of palm oil industry. So here you can see in this figure, what's happening in South America, Indonesia, Malaysia and Africa, the green in Africa, you can see over the years how that's increasing rapidly. And so we have in Indonesia and Malaysia the most amount of palm oil, but Africa is catching up quite quickly. Um, we believe that uh, Cameroon and the other West African countries will start producing uh, palm oil on the scale with Malaysia and Indonesia in the next, in this century. So what has palm oil? Now look at all these things. You've probably eaten or worked with palm oil today and you might not even know it. So palm oils and Nutella and crackers and Doritos and all kinds of candy bars and lipsticks. It's in so many different things. And so you must look at your packaging to see what has palm oil in it. It's almost unavoidable at this point. It's, um, that's what's happening. We're growing all these palm trees in order to make palm oil to provide us with these snacks and delicious foods, which taste so good because it's such a buttery kind of oil. But because of that, we're losing our forests and, be and because of the deforestation, this can lead to new diseases. And so this is an orangutan in, uh, in Indonesia, Borneo, and they're losing their habitat so rapidly that we're losing so many orangutans. That's the charismatic species, but there's so many other species which we are not even aware of that are being um, lost because of this deforestation. So my point here is that an emerging disease, they're increasing because of this deforestation throughout the world. So what does it mean to be an emerging disease? An emerging disease is a disease increasing in numbers in the population, increasing in geographical range, or increasing in host range. So if any of those things are happening, you can classify it as an emerging disease. Increasing in numbers, increasing in geographical range, and increasing in host range. So um, the coronavirus, SARS coronavirus number two, 
it emerged from China, right? So it's increasing in its in geographical range, and obviously it's increasing in numbers. And it was in bats originally, so it's increasing in its host range as well. Here are some other examples of emerging diseases. Did you know that HIV came from chimpanzees? So we believe that in the 20th century, in the early 20th century, HIV AIDS originated in chimpanzees, gotten to the human population in uh, the DRC Congo and spread to Kinshasa, which is the biggest city there, and basically started to spread into people all over the world. We know that SARS and the COVID-19 viruses originated in bats. Um, West Nile virus is in birds, but is spread by mosquitoes. Yellow fever is in monkeys, also spread by mosquitoes. Ebola was also from bats. So we believe in West Africa, some young boy became into contact with some bats and basically got Ebola and started spreading it. And that virus can also go to um, animals such as non uh, human primates and like gorillas. And then the Zika virus and, uh, is also from monkeys and that originated in Uganda. So you can see that all these emerging diseases came from other animals, got into humans and started being very dangerous, spreading all over the world. And so how does this happen? This is a piece of, um, this is a work that was published some years ago about how do, diseases emerge. First, on the bottom of this figure, you see stage one. You see pre-emergence, where you have naturally occurring microbes that are transmitted among their animal reservoirs. And this is pretty frequent, right? You see you have those animals on the left, and they get into other animals, and they keep going back and forth. So like the bats have coronavirus. They have a bunch of coronaviruses, and it keeps going from bat to bat, possibly to a monkey sometimes, and back into a bat but usually stages in that stage one, pre-emergence, okay? So most of those diseases in those animals never get into a human. However, in the stage two, you have localized emergence with self-limiting spillover events. So those red peaks there are sometimes where a virus will get into a human population and then eventually die out again. And this happens like with the Nipah virus and most often with Ebola virus, it gets into a human population and then it kind of gets eradicated, it leaves the population and it dies out in the population of humans. So those are these self-limiting spillover events that basically don't cause pandemics. Very rarely, such as what's happened with the coronavirus 2, is um, the SARS coronavirus 2, it's, emerged and got into international pandemic emergence. So some spillover events lead to indefinitely sustained human-human outbreaks. This is a rare event, but seemingly not as rare as we have thought, because there are other viruses that have done this. The Zika, the HIV, now the Ebola sometimes, and then we have this new COVID-19. And of course, we're very worried about bird flu too, like the H5N1, which could jump from birds and get into humans. And so these are the things that we worry about as disease ecologists. We think about what can happen when these diseases emerge and get into human populations. And so what we wanna do is study this early stage, stage one, where you have some viruses or bacteria or malaria type parasites getting into animals and how they change in their um, and those animals and what allows them to change. All right, so next slide we'll show here. These are the relative risks of an emerging infectious disease event. This was published in 2008, so already 12 years ago. But you can see in these panels, the first one on the left is risk from wildlife. So you see risk from wildlife where you have large populations of humans is in China and in India and in Europe and some parts of Africa and some parts of North and South America. Then you see risk from non-wildlife. Emerging diseases such as those would be um, basically antibiotic resistant diseases which are already in humans that might emerge again. Um, then we also have vector-borne diseases in the panel D. And so as all, in all of these ones, you can see particular hotspots you can see North India and you can see China and especially um, some places in Europe where you could imagine 
these emerging diseases to happen. So it's really not a coincidence that um, these viruses that we've seen today emerge in these high population centers where you have a lot of people in close contact with animals. And so that's what we believe happened with the um, coronavirus that we're plagued with right now. But so what happens with this rapid deforestation and diseases? So this is a place that I work in Cameroon. They cut down this huge rainforest to make palm oil plantations. Um, Cameroon is here. You can see where it is in Africa. It's in uh, Central West Africa. And uh, this is a video of uh, where I was, where they're cutting down the trees. It's just tragic where you see this going on. So our work basically goes to these spots before and after deforestation. And so here is a spot, and this is where we were previously, where it was a beautiful rainforest, and then they cut it down, and then they're gonna start planting these palm trees. Here's another one. And so I'm gonna show you this video here, and you can listen for a few minutes about where I was in the rainforest and what we're actually doing there. So here, you can see the edge of the forest. Where there, on the right side here, this will all be gone and converted to palm oil plantations. On the left side, for example, this tree here, it will survive. This is the demarcation marked by these red lines on these trees for the edge of the forest. We're mist netting, catching birds right on the edge of this demarcation. So in the future, after the palm oil plantation is established, we will come here again and capture mosquitoes and birds and identify the different types of diseases after deforestation, especially at this edge. We will look at this tree again in about a year's time at the exact same spot and see what happens to the biodiversity of birds, mosquitoes, and parasitic diseases like malaria with deforestation. Okay, so that explains the project in a short time. So why do we study birds? They have malaria, they have lots of diseases like the viruses, but they don't have money. They move around freely and they don't have doctors or drugs. So there's a very ecological system. So we can imagine what ha would happen with humans if we didn't have these kind of constraints. And so if humans uh, didn't have bed nets and malaria drugs, where would the disease be? And this is what we can do with birds. So we captured these birds in those nets like I showed you and put these little rings on them. You can see here, is a, this is an African bird, Andropodus laterostris, and it has a ring on its leg there. And we call that banding, and this is a mist net. So we take the bird, it gets into this mist net, we take it out of the net, take a drop of blood, and then release the bird, and it flies away. We get to work with some amazing birds. This is a blue-breasted kingfisher. This one is one of my favorites, an emerald cuckoo. Here we have a yellow-whiskered green bull. That was the one that was in the net there. This is a bird that we work with most commonly. We call this the target species. It's called the olive sunbird. And so we can use this bird because it's found in a lot of African rainforests all through Central and West and even some parts of Southern Africa. Here I am holding a little um, olive sunbird. There's they're pretty small. They're kind of like um, the hummingbirds of the forest. They don't have hummingbirds in, um, in the African rainforest. They're only in the New World. So hummingbirds are basically North and South America, but these sunbirds kind of take the role of the hummingbirds in these other regions of the planet. But we've got to work in some beautiful places. And so this is a, rain, uh, a beautiful rainforest with this waterfall. We can go swimming there. And um, here's my collaborators and my students all working in the um, African rainforest where we get to take a bath after the long day of work. But it's always, it's not always so pleasant. This is where I sleep in my tent for some weeks at a time. 
and uh, here's a snake that uh, was nearly uh, getting into my tent. So there's some scary things that happen. And then we got flooded. So this was a trip that we did a couple years ago where um, we couldn't get out. So we were stuck in this rainforest and working there with all of our supplies and everything. And it got so flooded that we were stuck inside this island and we had to basically cross over some trees in order to get all of our equipment out. Here's us catch, um, carrying all of our equipment over this tree that had fallen over the river because the river was flowing so fast after the rainstorms and we had to get out. This is our um, crew waiting for us at the end. We were never so happy to see anybody as we were after that, um, that adventure in the rainforest for those weeks. Here is a hawk. And here you can see on that hawk there, you see these flies, these are called black flies. And they feed and suck blood from these hawks or any other birds, lots of different birds. And they spread these types of parasites. And so this one spreads a parasite called leukocytosome, but it's related to malaria, basically. And so what is malaria? Malaria is a parasite. It lives in your blood and it really gets into a lot of people. We have about 200 million people a year and mortality is about half a million every year. That's a lot of people. Considering that we're so worried about coronavirus right now, you know, we're still losing more than half a million people, and those are mostly children that are dying from malaria. So it's a huge, huge problem. And we certainly don't shut down the world for this problem. Even though we have drugs to administer, they're just not getting to the people. And there are good drugs for malaria, but it still causes a lot of death, and it's quite tragic what's happening. They say that about half of all humans who've ever lived on the planet may have died from malaria. So malaria, it gets into people. It has lots of different uh, transformations. First, it lives in mosquitoes. It needs to have a mosquito stage in order for it to sexually reproduce. So actually, sexual reproduction happens in the mosquito of these parasites. Then these parasites are not related to viruses or to bacteria. They're very, very different. They're more like a human or a mosquito than they would be like a bacteria or a virus. So they're more related that to us than they are to viruses or bacteria. So they inject these sporozoites, which get into the liver. They go through lots of different changes in sexual differentiation. It's a very complex life cycle and involves many different transformations. That's why it's been so extremely difficult to develop a vaccine against malaria. But what do we think is happening? So we use this malaria in birds to understand what's happening with deforestation. And we believe that deforestation will lead to more global climate change because you don't, you lose basically the lungs of our planet with deforestation, loss of habitats, um, different mosquitoes, and this will lead to more bird diseases. And so a little bit more about bird malaria. Has anybody been to Hawaii here? I bet some of you have. But did you know that in Hawaii, most of the birds there went extinct because of malaria and other diseases. So the remaining birds in Hawaii that you see are birds that were imported that are basically resistant to the malaria type parasites. So 23 of 71 birds went extinct in Hawaii, 30 of the remaining ones of the 48 remaining ones are endangered. And the ones that we have now are on the tops of the mountains because there is too cold for the mosquitoes to survive. Right? And so at, that, at this point, we're very worried about global climate change because with global climate change, you'll have warming temperatures and you'll have mosquitoes going up the mountains to the tops of the mountains, and then we'll lose these remaining populations of birds. There is a mosquito on an apapane, and this is a po'ohuli, which we lost in 2004 when extinct. So what do we think? When we cut down the rainforest, we will have some population of malaria in the bigger forest and some maybe larger or smaller populations in the remaining forest. And so this is where we work in Cameroon. You see these little patches of our forest sites, what they're cutting down to make the palm oil um, plantations. And so we work on this area surrounded by the red and black checkered marks. And so they're cutting down that rainforest, and that's what I've shown you pictures of. So 
We know we go there beforehand, we go there during the process of deforestation, then we go there afterwards. And so what do we think is happening? So we think that, for example, in the left panel here, you'll see this black mosquito and it loves that red bird. And they just love to chomp on that red bird's blood. And then the green mosquito loves this um, kind of three colored bird on the right. But with deforestation, what we think happens is first we get different mosquitoes that might bite several birds. And then we also see like this green mosquito starts to feed on other birds because it can't always find the one it likes. So there's a called an ecological release. And so these mosquitoes start to feed on birds that they normally don't feed on. And that may lead to more parasites that are generalists that will spread throughout the community and dominate. And those would be the emerging diseases. These ones that are generalist parasites that feed on several different types of birds, okay? And so here are some palm, palm plantations. Um, we have this effect of bringing in water containers, which could also lead to more mosquito populations. So we've caught many, many thousands of mosquitoes. And we do this in a lot of different ways. CDC traps, sweep nets. Well, anyway, lots of different ways to catch mosquitoes. Now, what we find is that when you cut down the rainforest, it's not only affecting the birds, it can also affect the humans. And so when we cut down the rainforest, we see this one called Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. And they arrive very soon after the deforestation. And those are the mosquitoes that cause and spread dengue fever and also Zika and also yellow fever. So those are dangerous mosquitoes and they, they arrive very quickly after the deforestation. And that's something that we're trying to study some more, like how fast does that happen? How does that affect the disease transmission of those types of human diseases? We, we lose a lot of birds from deforestation. That's clear. You cut down the rainforest, we lose the bird diversity extremely. So we lose many, many of the birds that we normally find in the um, dense rainforest. And it's quite sad to see that happening. And then also our preliminary results are showing that these generalist malaria parasites are increasing in prevalence. We have about 30% of the birds are infected. We use microscopes and also PCR, which is a, a DNA technology to basically screen these birds and see what type of parasites they have. On the left there, you can see in these slides, you can see those are red blood cells. And then you see those blobs inside of the red blood cells are the parasites that live inside the bird's red blood cells. And so we find that there's some types of malarias coming out that might be emerging diseases. Now, these we're not worried about in terms of getting into humans, because bird malaria doesn't go into humans, but it could go into different birds that had never seen it before, like what happened in Hawaii, where we're losing a lot of the birds due to malaria. So that's what we're most concerned about, we'll lose more birds. But this is also a model to understand how does this jumping happen? How do these parasites jump from one host to another host that's never seen it before? And that's what's happening with the deforestation. We're seeing this type of jumping of parasites into birds that are different ones than they would normally see. All right, diseases come from the forest. We believe that palm oil is leading to deforestation, and then deforestation is leading to an increase in malaria. All right, that is our bit about the malaria. I want to talk a little bit about coronavirus because it's so pertinent for here. I'm going to go to another um, video, which I'm going to show here. Um, I'm going to go to this video. This is from a colleague of mine in Australia, the path to our next endeavor.
market history. The Dow, S&P, the NASDAQ, all down. Back to my PowerPoint. Right. So we believe that the bats are the hosts of the coronavirus. And that video talked about roads, but they didn't really talk about the palm oil. And so that's what I'm emphasizing here is the palm oil, but that will again lead to more spread of viruses and diseases. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about coronaviruses now. What are they? So Coronaviruses are microscopic, non-living things. So they're not alive. And this is something that I want to stress, that they're not like bacteria or parasites like malaria. These are microscopic little blobs. So if you think about it like a little flash drive that goes into the computer. It's not anything, it's just information. And that gets into a cell and then the cell starts to get triggered by that information and starts to make more viruses. So I'll talk a little bit about what this coronavirus replication is because it's so um, pertinent and um, important to understand what's happening right now. So what is a coronavirus? So you see here, a coronavirus, first of all, they call it a coronavirus because of the spikes. So if you look at this little tiny blob, it's microscopic, you will never be able to see it with your eyes. It has these little blue things on the outside um, those are the spike proteins. And those will bind to your cells through a protein called ACE2. All right, so there inside of it is RNA, and then there's proteins. There's some other proteins. But remember that it's basically a little piece of um, fat. That's what you can think about, a fat droplet microscopic with some RNA inside. And so that's why using soap destroys it instantly, because just like soap destroys fat in your frying pan, it will destroy the virus pretty fast. And so use soap and, or alcohol, and that will destroy the virus. There's RNA inside. Remember the central dogma of biology is that you have DNA inside your cells. Those get converted by transcription to RNA, and those RNAs get translated into proteins. Right? That's the central dogma of biological um, studies. And so a coronavirus, you can see here, it looks like a sun kind of, with a little spike protein sticking out. That is why they call it a coronavirus, because it looks like the sun, the corona of the sun. So it's a large, enveloped, positive sense, single-stranded RNA virus. You may not all understand what that means, but what it means is that enveloped, I mean, it has that little bubble around it, that little tiny, um, fat bubble, positive sense means it's almost like an RNA in every one of our cells. That means it can be converted to proteins very easily in our cells. It has those club-shaped projections. So it's microscopic. You need an electron microscope to see these things. Here are some of the main proteins, if you're interested. The S protein that people are talking about a lot is the one that we're interested to make these types of uh, vaccines from. The spike protein is that blue one that was on the outside. It binds to a protein on your cells that are found in your lungs, arteries, heart, kidney, and intestines. That protein is called angiotensin converting enzyme 2, ACE2. And that's a protein important for blood pressure regulation. Okay, so that Spike protein allows the virus to bind to your cells through that ACE2. It gets into your cells and it starts to replicate. What happens is it has an RNA that just looks like any old RNA in your body and it gets translated into proteins. There's some proteins, there's like 29 proteins and they have a bunch of different jobs copying the coronavirus and also suppressing the body's immune responses. So the S protein binds to that ACE2, it goes into your cells. Then there's this thing called polymerase, which will replicate it. Then there's this, um, the transcription, it starts to make more of itself, more RNAs. And then you have more of the proteins like the S protein. And finally, they get butted off from your cells. They kill your cells and they butt off to get into the environment again, mostly spread through sneezing and coughing. 
Um, here again is a, a depiction of this. The virus enters on that left top part with the ACE2 receptor. It fuses, it goes through this uncoding, and then that RNA is basically like any old RNA in our bodies, and it starts to be translated into proteins. This is not in the nucleus, it's in the cytoplasm of your cell. It goes through this translation and it makes a lot of different um, proteins and a lot of different RNAs to self-replicate. Then it buds off on this right-hand side translation, goes through these different compartments like the Golgi and the rough endoplasmic reticulum, gets into a vesicle and exocytosis means it's released from the cell and it buds out. That's a little bit about the coronavirus. And so you can get a sense of like this virus is very sneaky because it looks just like a mRNA, a messenger RNA inside your cells, gets translated into proteins very easily and then starts to bud off and it basically kills your cells in this process. Um, the SARS coronavirus 2 is about 80% identical to the original SARS coronavirus from 2003. That was the one that killed about 800 people and 8,000 people got infected, also originated in bats in China. So the major difference of this spike protein between the 2019 and the 2003 one are some small little insertions um, in that spike protein. So a few amino acids, the building blocks of the protein are a little bit different. Now, coronavirus is different than MERS, the one that was written the camels, the Middle East um, Respiratory Syndrome. That one binds to a different protein in your body, and we believe that's why the MERS was much more dangerous. Anyway, it doesn't bind to these other proteins. It only binds to ACE2 that we know of at this point. So how does the virus spread? It spreads from person to person through coughs and sneezes like the flu. It also gets into your mouth, nose, or eyes, possibly through feces, um, takes two to 14 days for the person to show some symptoms, and people likely are most infection when they're symptomatic through the coughing and sneezing. And it appears that people without symptoms can also spread this virus. So now what do we do about all these emerging diseases? We've got coronavirus, we've got these malarias, we've got um, Zika and HIV and, um, you know, these other West Nile viruses and things like that, which also originated in Africa. What can we do? First of all, I recommend avoiding buying palm oil products because again, the palm oil industry is leading to the rapid deforestation, which brings people into contact with these animals, like bats, the gorillas, the chimpanzees, the monkeys that can spread these viruses and diseases to humans. So as people encroach the rainforest, they're more, in, um, more likely to get these viruses. And the best thing we can do is to save our rainforest. One of those things we can do is to stop buying palm oil. Learn about the environment. Learn about what's happening in the tropical rainforest. I would say there's so many things you can learn. There's papers, there's National Geographic magazines, there's so many resources. Listen for the birds. I mean, the birds, it just if you're interested in the nature, you're going to be much more passionate about saving it. And that's why I think it's important for students all over the planet to have the opportunities to get out into nature. And I think it's quite tragic how the funding for our school systems in this country has led to the disruption of field trips and opportunities for young people to get out into the rainforest and not into the rainforest, into any forest, into nature. Go into nature as much as you can, support environmental organizations. There's so many of them, I won't even name them because there's so many of them, but I even have one that I am supporting in Cameroon that I'm, we, what we do is with this organization, I can send you information if you're interested, is to basically teach young people about the rainforest in Cameroon. Our problem in Cameroon right now is of course, not only the COVID-19, but there's a, um, a civil war going on. So for right now, my research has stopped completely. I can't go there, not because of COVID-19, but that's the reason for now, but because there has been a civil war going on between the Southwest region where this work has been going on and the French speaking part of the main part of Cameroon. Anyway, support environmental organizations, 
support education. We know that education will lead to fewer um, people, fewer babies. It's super important. So supporting education around the world is a key responsibility of all of us. These are my students that I work with in Cameroon. They're fantastic people. And unfortunately, they're all suffering right now because they're under lockdown and there's so much poverty already in Cameroon. It's really a tragedy. If you think you have it bad here, wait till you go to Africa. So I don't want to end on a sour note, but these people are tremendous and um, fantastic students able to help us. And they've been doing this research now for several years. We're publishing some papers about this work. Um, it's been, there's one paper that was just published in International Journal of Parasitology. All right, I think that's been about 45 minutes. That's what Simran wanted me to do. So I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to go back to Simran. Are you there? I'm here. So if anyone has any questions, um, go ahead and type in the, in the chat or you can raise your hand and um, Ravinder's here to answer anything. And that you have for him. Um, I see that Stardust has something. Let me unmute you. All right, go ahead, Stardust. Hi, Stardust. Hey, Ravinder. Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful lecture. I was wondering, um, do any human diseases develop first in humans and then maybe some of those spread to animals? Or is it more like diseases originate in all the animals and kind of spread around all of them? Okay, so we know that there's some human diseases. Um, for example, we know that there's some viruses that get into gorillas. And actually Ebola goes from humans to gorillas. Also human malaria can go into chimpanzees. But we believe that the majority of the diseases that we have originated in animals at some point. Obviously not cancer or heart disease and things like that, but a lot of infectious diseases originated in other animals. We believe like, um, uh, there's some that we're not so sure about, like tuberculosis, but most of the ones that you can think of have some kind of animal origin that have been with us for many, many years. Now, in the new world, there's very many fewer of these types of diseases. So I think one of the only ones was um, perhaps syphilis that came from the new world, but most of the viruses came from the old world with agriculture and started to move with human populations into the new world. And of course, the Native Americans were decimated by old world diseases. And that destroyed our Native American populations much more than guns or human uh, Western enco encroachment, the European encroachment. So if you ever read that um, book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, you'll learn about that. But um, clearly, most at this point that we've, most of the infectious diseases a large number of them originated in animals. Thanks. Is there anyone else? Um, oh, um, do you have the links for some of the charities and organizations that you're supporting? Yes, I will give you um, that one that I work with in Cameroon. I don't know how to get it to you right now, but I can certainly get it up. Okay, um, you can also send it to me and I'll email everybody. Um, I really appreciate that, Simran. Yeah, of because course. It's a really wonderful organization working with children in Cameroon, teaching them about birds, teaching them about deforestation, trying to get protection for the forests of Cameroon, trying to get young people to appreciate the forest so that they stop hunting animals. Because there's a lot of bushmeat trade, which is, of course, another lead, leading cause of um, emerging diseases. That's how we think HIV got into humans is through the uh, hunting of chimpanzees. In Western Africa, people eat chimpanzees. And so we believe that led to the emergence of this virus, HIV. Great. Um, I have um, one question for you. How mm -hmm. did you get into this? What drove oh. you to go th in this direction, which is pretty amazing. It's very a nice story. So I was a musician mostly for a lot of my life. And then I um, studied biology at a small liberal arts college called Oberlin in Ohio. And then I was accepted to UC San Francisco as a graduate student. And I did my PhD in cell and molecular biology. Um, from there, I was like, this is kind of boring working on one part of one molecule. And so I decided that after I finished my PhD, I went into um, ecology, ecology of disease. And I did a postdoctoral fellowship at San Francisco State 
with a professor, Tom Smith, who's at UCLA now. And he introduced me to working with birds in Africa. And that's how I got on this trajectory. That was in 1999 when I started this. It's been about 20 years or so since I've been working on these birds of Africa and um, diseases of birds around the world. Thanks. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Oh, yes, I do. There we um, go. This is John back. Gonzalez here. Oh, Hi, I was wondering um, what exactly makes bats um, such effective vectors for disease? I've noticed in your talk that a lot of diseases are spread through them. Right. So bats spread hantavirus, they have Nipah virus, they've got Ebola and the coronaviruses. So a bunch of diseases are spread by bats. Now, why bats? Um, Ebola. Why would the bat have Ebola and not get sick from it? This is amazing. So bats have very, very unusual immune system. They have to develop, because they fly, most of their energy goes to flight, okay? So because of that, their immune systems are not as, um, as effective at removing these types of invaders in their systems. They have to spend a lot of their energy going to these, um, to, to flying. And so I think the understanding now is that they devote so much of their energy to flying, they really just have a lot of viruses in them and that um, they don't have immune systems that really destroy those viruses, they have a gut, but they've also become tolerant to a lot of viruses. So it's kind of amazing that they can be tolerating these rabies and all these different things and not die from them, but then spread them so easily to other types of mammals. Um, you know, there's a lot of research going on that. I know some people at UC Berkeley here are studying this immunology of bats. It's going to be a very important field. And I think that's the understanding now is that they're just devoted so much time to their, so much energy to flying that they have a very different type of immune system than we do. But I, I can't answer your question in a very definitive way because that kind of research is really important for people to do right now. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Mm. You caught me mid-bite of a carrot. Um, hi, Ravinder, this is Dinah. I'm curious, do you have any names of any other organization or organizations um, that are working to bring about awareness around the whole palm oil connection oh. um, with deforestation? Because I'm just thinking again about getting this out at least on my social media, which hopefully then will, you know, spread to other social media, just, just for more awareness. Well, you know, Greenpeace does a lot of work on this. And so Greenpeace has mapped all these um, forests going through deforestation in Cameroon and has tried to um, approach legislators. Of course, it's a very corrupt government in Cameroon. So it's extremely difficult. But yes, Greenpeace is a big one. And then there's other groups um, that work on this. But I would say Greenpeace is a good one. Okay. So I probably can find more information that I can then forward yeah, absolutely. on. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Sure, sure. It's good to hear you. Yeah. I, um, Stardust has another question. I just. Hi. Hi. Uh, sorry. I hope I'm, it's okay to ask a couple. The, absolutely. The, um, I'm curious about the birds. Um, did it just, was it kind of by circumstance that you ended up really uh, doing a lot of research with birds or do you have, do you feel like you have some kind of special affinity with birds? Oh, you know, I honestly didn't, I, I thought I was gonna be a marine biologist, but I get really seasick, so I can't really do that. But um, I started doing the birds basically because of my postdoctoral research. And then I got much more into it. So it wasn't like I was, eager to work with birds I was a kid already. I was always interested in um, basically extinct species and what was happening with extinction. Even as a kid, I was very concerned about extinction and loss of wildlife, but it wasn't only birds. It was basically all wildlife, mostly animals. I wasn't as much a plant person. But then um, the birds came out just because it was a really nice system and I um, got involved in this larger from a larger perspective not just the birds only but from how does 
um, bird diseases, how that can be used as a model for conservation biology. So at heart, I am a conservation biology, but I use molecular biology and ecological tools to study, to have conservation biology ramifications. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I just wanted to say thank you to Simran again. So um, we had another uh, National Geographic Explorer a couple of weeks ago, Julia de Marinas. I think there are other National Geographic Explorers who are interested in speaking. So hopefully we'll get them hooked up with the canopy space pretty soon. Um, you know, I just really like to get this work out there. And um, please contact me if you have any questions. My email is Segal, S-E-H-G-A-L, at sfsu.edu. And you can email me about questions. And what I will do is send Simran the information about my um, NGO in Cameroon, so you can read about that as well. Yeah, and also, um, so if you go to, I put the links for our YouTube and Facebook pages in the chat box and our website, which is www.canopy.space. Um, and I'll send um, Ravinda's email address also in, in a second. Um, can you, can also, here, right? you can type it in, there you go. Um, so we, as Ravinda mentioned, we're gonna be having a series of talks um, with more explorers. Everyone loves these, these, these events. Um, and if you sign up for our newsletter on our main website, you can see all the events that I put on. There's probably about three to four a week that I do. And, and if you have any ideas, I'll send you an email and let me know who we can bring in. So thank you again, and I hope to see you here soon. Thanks, Simran, for inviting me. Bye. Bye.